Welcome to part two of my three-part video guide on how motion controls work in Game Builder's Garage. Today we'll be talking about the hand nodon and the IR motion camera. Remember to check out part one for tilt and motion controls and part three for touch screen controls. Let's go. Let's talk about the hand nodon. The hand nodon for some reason is put in first person mode, which kind of makes sense if you're making a shooter, but it's really more of a control scheme. Left and right hand just correspond to which Joy-Con you're talking about. And if you set it to automatic, then a pro controller will work this just fine. The hand has two main controller ports, one to grab and one to move things forward or backwards. And you'll understand what that means soon. The hand is more of a control scheme. So here you can see that I can move this white little beam across the... When using hand controls, a lot of people don't know this, so you do need to explain this to the player. You need to press R3. You need to press down the right stick. And now the hand control will appear on screen as a thin white beam. Now hand controls are kind of like you're pointing around the screen, like left and right, kind of like, imagine Link's crossbow training or in Super Mario Galaxy when you're shooting star bits at the screen. You can move the hand cursor around with ease and relative precision. Now, since I defined a grab button, whenever I see a grabbable object, we can pick it up by holding that button. And I also have the other control stick for forward and backwards. And that allows me to bring this box closer to me or farther away. So I can use this to place blocks around with relative precision. What if I don't want the player to grab this block? Well, go to other settings and can't be grabbed. Now, even if I put my hand cursor over, I can't really grab it. It's, it's a fruitless effort. Keep in mind that even if you have a block that's not grabbable, you can still totally grab grabbable things behind it and move them around. This can be a problem, so you wanna be really careful with using a hand note on. On the plus side, this also means that you can grab things through invisible walls. There are other settings like hold grab versus toggle grab. A hand note on can be set to snappy or precise. In precise mode, however far you grab an object is how far it will be. In snappy mode, no matter how close or far that object is, it will snap to a certain distance away from the hand note on whenever you grab it. This distance is called the snap distance. Additionally, you can add a launch speed to the hand note on, so whenever you let go of something, you can throw things with a little bit more oomph. A hand note on also has a connection port. If you tie an object to that connection port, the hand will grab it and never let go. For this mode, it's best to use snappy with a certain snap distance, where the snap distance will determine how far away from you that object is being held. The connection point of the object will also matter. When you get this right, it allows you to make an object that you can always hold in your hand kind of like a weapon and then use it potentially to interact with the game world. So for example, here I have a little pink lightsaber that I can use to smash blocks. When working with a hand note on, there are two sensors that are really helpful to work with. First is the touch sensor, which you can set to check for the presence of hands. And you can also use a grab sensor to check that something has been lifted up. This sensor can be set to output a one only the moment that you grab something or one as long as it's being held in your hands. So here, when my hand passes through that touch sensor, the box turns blue. And this is without grabbing the touch sensor. It just has to be pointed at it. Additionally, the moment I grab the box and pick it up, it turns pink and it'll be pink until I let go. One last note with the hand note on is to be careful that you can actually grab sensors and move them around, which can be really useful and also potentially annoying if you don't remember to change the settings. I have here a little demo level to show you exactly how this works. So here, literally tell the player at the start, press this button, otherwise they have no idea what's going on. Then this level is all about grab the ball, put to the apple. Then you can grab a ball and move it through this obstacle course through a little maze or whatever. And overall, the controls are actually pretty smooth for this. I also have an obstacle to find this level where if the ball touches the yellow, then you're forced to let go for one second. This makes it so that in this level, you have to actually throw the ball and chuck it in order to get it through this sort of obstacle. To close up on hand note on, hand note on is really good when you just wanna like grab things or move them around. Now let's go on to the one that people understand the least, which is the IR motion camera. So let's open up the IR motion camera. Here, we only really have two settings. We have the controller port and we have a distance to recognize. Keep in mind that the IR motion camera is only this little black part of your right Joy-Con, which in default colors is red. The way it works is that it shoots a beam of IR light out at an object, it reflects some IR light, and then it comes back. And then here, this black screen also hides an IR camera, which sees the IR light that you emitted. My camera shows IR light, so when I point my remote control 
at the camera and press the remote. Then you see this bright white light. I don't see anything because infrared is below the visible spectrum. I just can't, like, I don't see anything, but I can with the camera. The same premise works with the IR emitter in this Joy-Con. So here I have distance to recognize IR off. IR off means the IR emitter is not going off. Now when I set distance to recognize to near, now you see a little white light show up. That white light is IR that it's being emitted by this Joy-Con. When I change between near and normal, not much happens. Now when I set it to near and far, you see multiple IR lights to come and illuminate the scene. This little gray screen over here is kind of like the picture of what you catch on this IR camera. You can actually see much greater re resolution than this, but the game kind of like converts this into a binary image. So it's just black and white, a couple of rectangles to show off images. First, let's talk about the settings when the IR camera is actually on. So you can set the distance to recognize to near, normal, or near and far. And this changes what you can recognize. Let's say I want to see a picture of my hand in the IR camera. So here at a normal distance, I can see that is the base of my hand. Here you can see it back and forth, as well as my fingertips there. It's a, you have to use a little bit of your imagination, but those are indeed my fingers wiggling them. This is the sort of image that you'll be able to play with with this IR camera. You can change the distance that the camera is checking by changing this to near instead of normal. And so here, my hand is not really appearing until it gets much, much closer. I have to be basically point blank in order for my hand to register now. This button just mirrors the image left, right. When you set IR off, the IR emitter itself is no longer illuminated. However, you can still check other IR sources. For example, with this remote, which emits this flickering IR light, we can see in the middle of the image an equally flickering little block there that moves relative to the IR camera. If you're willing to take the plunge and demand that the player needs a second Joy-Con to play your level, then you can use the IR emitter note on. Here I have a second red Joy-Con. The one for port two is marked with this masking tape to make it a little bit easier. The IR light note on will set a certain controller to emit IR light for a certain amount of time after it gets a signal. Here, with a constant radiation, you can see that the IR emitter is indeed on. If we go back to the IR motion camera on controller number one, we can look at the light on controller number two, and this gives a very steady and very stable spot, which moves very consistently relative to the position of the Joy-Con. There are other IR sources that work as well, but if you want to do something with IR off, this is gonna be one of your best bets. Of course, you can set this to be on a trigger. My personal recommendation is not to do that. In general, you want the player to have constant feedback so they understand exactly where they are relative. Like, it can be really disorienting if you need this configuration and the hour light turns off for some period of time and then you just kind of like wander elsewhere and now it suddenly picks up again and you're in a totally wrong spot. That's the gist of how the IR camera works. But now I'm gonna show you how we can use this in our levels, like how we can actually detect on it. Remember that the IR camera shows hot spots. It shows how many little boxes you have and you can move them around like with your fingers. But the first thing is gonna be how many boxes are there? The number of boxes is the raw output of the note on. And so here, if we have no signal, we have no boxes, one hot spot is one, if it finds some other artifacts or whatever, it can flicker around. These images in general have a lot of artifacts. So you see all those tiny little boxes at the side of the IR camera note on. While they may not mean a whole lot in terms of like the real image, they are changing the number of boxes by quite a lot. And so let's say that I'm looking at my hand for the number of fingers, right? Let's say I have here at this distance, I see my five fingers and also the side table versus if I get a little bit closer, they start to fuse together sometimes, or you have more or fewer boxes. It's not super consistent. If I turn IR off, this might be a lot more consistent for you, but you might still have some miscellaneous artifacts because IR radiation can come from many different sources. In general, I don't recommend you use this port very much, unless you want to like detect very sneakily if someone's holding a Joy-Con in their hands. In general, the IR camera is also sensitive to the wrist strap being in the way but you don't normally have to worry about this because I'm the only person on the planet who actually wears this thing. The main way to use the IR camera is to really use the marker node on in here. So like, just like with the marker node on, you see that light blue area that appears, all right? That light blue area can be detected with a bullseye node on, and we can use that to detect what's going on in here. This brings me to the main point of why you'd want to use the IR camera. The IR camera is really good at measuring distance. So for tilt controls and shake and rotation speed, these are all relative 
to the Joy-Con's frame of reference, all right? It doesn't matter if I'm doing it over here or close to my table or by my chest. There's no difference with these controls. But the IR motion camera does care. It looks at distances relative to real objects. So for example, take this table here. How can I possibly know how far my Joy-Con is from this table, right? You can't really use shape controls. You can't really use tilt, but you can look at how much signal you have on the IR motion camera. Here, ignore the number of rectangles because this will not be very consistent. However, if you look at the total signal, just look at all the amount of marker that's inside this area, the amount of signal inside of that marker really lights up. And you can measure this super consistently. This is probably the best use of the IR motion camera, which is primarily to judge distance from one specific spot, like your lap or a table or whatever. Also, taking a page from Atomic Force Microscopy, you can try to figure out where something is relative, left, right, or up, down, by looking at the total signal on the left minus the total signal on the right. Here I'm taking the whole right side of the image minus the whole left side of the image. So look at what happens when I sweep like this. Here, you see that I can actually get like a decent shot of where the table is relative. We can also take the whole top versus the whole bottom. So when I swipe across like this, I can also check roughly where that table is. If I plot the combination here, you can see that I can actually have like a pretty decent idea of what my angle is relative to the table. However, it should be noted that this is super janky and not really consistent, especially when the player can't really see exactly what's going on under the hood. Thus, in my opinion, the best way to use the IR motion camera is actually to measure distance relative to a fixed object. So here, you can see me spanking my Joy-Con actually very, very consistently. And you can set up the proper dead zone in order to make this work. You can see it in this hardcore milking level where you can literally rig it so that you have to be close relative to the floor. So here, if I'm very far from the table, we don't really get much movement. It's not really based on shake. And if you shake too hard, the cow will buck. The IR camera allows me to set up this amazingly immersive action-based gameplay where you're milking a cow. And it's actually super consistent. Like here, I can easily get a score of like 300 within 69 seconds. Also, this cow is my favorite. With that, this concludes part two of this series on hand controls and IR controls. Stay tuned for part three where I'll discuss touchscreen controls. And by the way, yes, touchscreen controls do work when docked with a controller. That's all I have for you today. If you like this content, feel free to like and subscribe, and I'll see you around for part three. Later.